Member for Morley. I do not lay claim to the stature or respect that was earned by the former member of Morley, but his work in the electorate and the Bayswater Council, which has already been publicly recognised, has provided me with an excellent foundation on which to build on. I want to take this opportunity to thank the marvellous group of people who supported me during my election campaign. The campaign for the seat of Morley is now well and truly over. It was an unusual campaign in many respects and ultimately a close run affair. However, the support and enthusiasm of my campaign team and their unwavering loyalty to me was never in question. To them I owe the deepest debt of gratitude. We all genuinely enjoyed the campaign while at the same time being acutely aware that no one knew who we were, how to spell my name, didn't even know what I looked like. But with your consent, Mr Speaker, I would like to place on public record my sincerest thanks and appreciation to my elder brother and sister, uh, my elder brother Ross Britzer, who's up at the gallery, and my sister Joy Evans, whose faithful and loyal support over many years has enabled me to stand here today on behalf of the Britzers Australia-wide with, with a great deal of genuine pride and humility. To many others too numerous to share, I also express thanks for their enthusiastic support over such a short but remarkable political operation. I would like to acknowledge several people in particular. Firstly, Mr Jonathan Daventry, who somehow saw in me the potential of a man who could serve the Liberal Party with dignity and respectability and possibly be elected into Parliament. Neither of us fully realised that all of this would happen in just eight short months. I joined the party in January, was pre-selected a week after the election was called, and now sit alongside my colleagues in government. It's difficult not to offer a little bit of this to divine providence. I would like to acknowledge the friendship and support and encouragement of Bishop Harry Westcott from Alectown, New South Wales, who has continually spoken into my life and encouraged, upheld and supported me for over 25 years. This is a man who is highly respected on five continents, and I'm honoured to have had this man as a colleague and deeply appreciated friend. To Dr Graham and Catherine Jacobs, who came alongside my wife and I and gently but persuasively encouraged us to turn our hearts towards being involved in politics. This led us to finally joining the Liberal Party, and now we are part of Western Australian parliamentary history. I would also like to acknowledge Dr Kenneth Copeland from Fort Worth, Texas, USA. Now, this is a man who believed in me when it wasn't popular to do so and saw in me something that I didn't completely see at first, Mr Speaker, which was a deep love, admiration and appreciation of my own country and my responsibility to stand up and take my place to serve her where needed. When I fell and failed, he had compassion on me and helped put me on my feet spoke over me only words that would make me rise to the destiny and call on my life. How important it is to show mercy and compassion when it is, when it is in our power to do so. To this man, Mr Speaker, I owe much. And I'm grateful and honoured. to call him a friend, a teacher, and an important and significant influence in my life. I would like to acknowledge the influence and encouragement of Mr Barry Court, who is up in the gallery, current president of the WA Liberal Party. This man helped restore my faith in leadership. He is a man not concerned about popularity, fiercely loyal, even to his own hurt. He is vitally concerned about truth, and above all, he can be trusted. To this man, 
I dedicate the triumph and absolute joy of winning the seat of Morley. I would like to acknowledge the love and support of my wife, Penny. After speaking at countless conferences and conducting numerous seminars all over the world on all aspects of family issues, counselling and offering advice to many couples and young people, I found myself divorced and beginning to experience the depth of despair and ostracism by my peers, anguish and hopelessness that many others who experience this go through. When Penny came into my life, I found the love and passion and finally direction that I needed to have. I didn't know that a man could be loved by a woman the way Penny expresses her love to me. It doesn't matter what I achieve in public life during the day, Mr Speaker, but there is nothing that beats the joy of going home to someone who actually is delirious and excited to see you. Now, to my wife I owe much, and her love and passion towards me, although is still a complete mystery to me, is something that I have never taken for granted, and I express that to her often. Now, the members of this House may be excused for wondering why in the world am I expressing my heart so publicly and passionately about my wife? Well, it's because the best gift that I can give my electorate, Mr Speaker, is a stable, passionate and loving home, because they will know that I will deal with them with the same honour, respect, integrity and love that is expressed in my private life. Thank you, Penny, for loving this man when he had nothing, lost everything and even lost his way a little. I'm so very grateful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've got drinks all over the place. <laughs> it's only water, though. <laughs> yes, I'm very grateful for the silence. I am a very grateful and appreciative husband who will never forget what you have done for me. To my elder sons, Timothy and Michael, I say thank you for encouraging your father every step of the way. You never wavered in your support, and I'm truly thankful for your love, encouragement and support. I give thanks to my young 15-month-old son, Samuel. Sounds like I'm going right through the family here, but that's OK. I never could have imagined that I could have loved a boy the way I love my son. Truly, he has been God's personal gift to me. Now, Mr Speaker, there are several issues that confront Morley that I would like to focus on just a couple of them today. I have two high schools and several primary schools in my electorate, and I have been disheartened by the physical condition of several of them. In the Morley Senior High School, there is an absolute urgent and pressing need for the entire science block to be completely and entirely refurbished. The science benches all have had the laminated tops completely removed, exposing the timber and all the gas fixtures, which are from the early 70s, and they simply need to be replaced, just to name a few things. The World Square Primary School is in desperate need of an appropriate administration block which I can add is a fairly standard request from most schools I hear. Some of the classroom conditions are appalling and are in a dire need of a complete refurbishment or an entire rebuilding program. I am sure that many schools throughout the state are going through the same frustrations experienced by the schools in my electorate, Mr Speaker. However, this does not diminish the need of a program of rebuilding and refurbishing to be re-established in the education department rather than just a maintenance program. The Morley parents and concerned citizens have done a remarkable job in supporting these schools while they deal with the pressing issues that seem to be confronting them on a daily basis with no feeling of finality and completion within their hearts. I make the commitment to stand up and be counted for these teachers, parents and their schools in order to maintain the quality of education in adequate and satisfactory classrooms and administration facilities that they all thoroughly deserve. The seniors of my electorate, Mr Speaker, are numerous in number, and while I have not met all of the associations and clubs that represent them, I intend to meet with them and raise my voice on their behalf in this parliament. In many cultures, the elderly are held in high respect. It is to our shame that we do not follow the same example. They do have a voice, and it is getting rather loud these days. It is simply wrong that their cries and concerns are not being heard, or at least apparently not being acknowledged. Now, Mr Speaker, when I won the election of Morley, I knew that the people didn't know me and that the vote was primarily against the previous government. 
And I felt, however, like the adopted son. The people voted in me, however, just like an adopted baby. They really didn't know where I came from, what I was like, what I believed, and most probably hoped I stood at least for Liberal Party policies, which I do. So what are my principles? What are my ethics and personal beliefs? My parents, the Reverend Bill and Beryl Britzer, were missionaries for just on 20 years in Malawi, Africa, before coming Baptist pastors here in Western Australia, where he pastored in churches in Cochinut, Wood Nilling. Anyone know where Wood Nilling is? Bayswater, and finally in Liverpool, New South Wales. I was the fifth child of six children and was born here in Perth before heading off for Malawi until I was nearly six years old. My arrival back in Perth was quite traumatic, as my parents related to me, because it was only back in Australia that I realised that I was white. And this was exasperated by the fact that I spoke predominantly Chinyanja, a Zulu tongue, and little English. However, it didn't take long for the white genes to kick in. I started clapping on the on beat, couldn't sing, and certainly had no rhythm. I did, however, survive this experience intact, and I bring this anecdote before the House because I believe it laid the foundation for the genuine care and awareness I have in my heart for the people of Africa. Our state has many representatives from this particular nation, and I have been, had the privilege of representing the Premier at several African functions, of which I'm honoured to have done so. And I would consider it an honour to be counted with the many people from Africa who now call Western Australia their home and bring their desires and concerns before this House. I also share, Mr Speaker, my unashamed support and love for the nation of Israel. I have personally visited this nation and my heart is tender towards these people. History has shown time and time again that whoever supports and honours this nation truly becomes prosperous, flourishes and increases in influence. So therefore I publicly declare my support and loyalty to this nation. Having married a beautiful, strong and passionate native of Texas, and I hasten to add to the House, there's a huge difference between a Texan and an American. Just ask her. I have a natural love and admiration and deep respect and honour for the United States of America. I am well aware of this nation's real and perceived failures. However, it stands on its own in the world as a nation whose people stand for what is right and have a deep-seated heart and belief in democracy, freedom and justice. Now, whether or not you support the United States of America, it is a sober thought to consider that no one thinks to invade us because of our excellent alliance with this nation, whose owned armed forces have also given their lives for our nation's freedom. It's very important also to state at this time my declarations towards the nations and its people uh, who also are in my electorate and in our state, and in no way diminishes the total respect and value I have to them all. That, to all that call Western Australia their home, and I'm equally thrilled and delighted to become a part of their lives and represent them as well. In light of the fact that I have been a minister of the church for nearly 30 years, I understand how many people would immediately, without much thought, put me into a particular religious box. So I'd like to take this opportunity to either confirm that matter or go the other way. I am not ashamed of the foundational spiritual principles that were given to me by my parents. They not only gave me sound spiritual guidance for my future welfare and personal benefit, but they also instilled in me a sense of right. It truly amazes me that people can have a perceived genuineness about what is right or wrong and still totally miss what is truth. Very soon, as far as morals and ethics are concerned, Mr Acting Speaker, Deputy beg your pardon, two plus two are definitely going to add up to five at the rate we're going. The community already laughs and mocks at the apparent lack of common sense among politicians and are particularly annoyed when their decisions via referendums and other forums are not received or taken seriously. We pass some legislations and laws that the vast community don't agree with or understand and then we wonder in amazement at the cynical attitudes that are growing within our citizens and the media toward us. I, as a rule, don't listen much to cynics, and any time I hear someone declare themselves to be one, 
I remember the writer of Proverbs declaring, a cynic is someone who is constantly looking for wisdom and never finds it, and all he finds at the door of his heart are stockpiles of stupidity. I guess we just need to leave those who express cynicism the most with their own pile of stupidity and leave it at that. Some previous speakers have already alluded to the decline in our moral values. A lot of people, Mr Deputy Speaker, often query why morality is such a strong issue with those who hold strong spiritual values. It's quite simple, really. Every civilization that has lost its compass where morals are concerned have simply slipped into history and its people have always paid an extremely high price. Just because we live in the 21st century doesn't mean that the consequences of the past won't come to us. Morality is an interesting thing, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I have sometimes meditated on the old fairy tale of the king that wore no clothes. Everyone was trying to convince themselves that the king was wearing clothes so they wouldn't be seen as foolish, stupid, out of date, irrelevant, and in our case, haven't passed into the new 21st century thought patterns and beliefs, as though morals actually evolve. But the fact was, the king was as naked as could be, and it took a little boy to declare it out of simple common sense. He knew the king was naked and just said it. No meditation, no excuses, no explanations, no committees, no legislation, no legal briefs, no conferences, no marches. He just said it because it was simply true. It was a fact. He was naked. Mr Speaker, just because it's legal doesn't make it right. Just because a bill is presented and is passed by majority doesn't mean it's right. Just because abortion is legal doesn't make it right. When a woman who is pro-choice wants a child, she calls it a baby. And when she doesn't want it, she calls it a fetus. It may be legal, but it's not right, Mr Deputy Speaker. This brings me to my final point, to give you some encouragement. While obviously holding onto sound biblical Judeo-Christian beliefs and principles, I find myself simply thinking, is the decision before me simply right? Situational ethics is a dangerous path to walk when there are no absolutes to guide oneself in making decisions that affect hundreds and thousands of people. When listening to bills being presented in this chamber, I will be constantly asking myself, is this right or is this wrong? I will make decisions based on moral absolutes because they are not persuaded by how we personally think or feel about a matter. Two plus two will always be four, even if we don't like it or are angry about it and frustrated by it, it will always be four. Moral judgments are the same. You can say whatever you want to say, you can believe whatever you want to believe, you can act however you want to act, but moral absolutes simply remain the same. Therefore, Mr Speaker, can I have an extension of time? Thank you, sir. The Therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, I conclude with a statement that shall be a guiding rule to my term in my electorate of Morley and in this House, and it is this. Easy to do justice, very difficult to do right. Therefore, let right be done. I thank the members for this, uh, of this House for the friendship and goodwill extended to me, and I humbly express the honour it is for me to be a part of this chamber and to serve the people of Western Australia, the people of Morley, the Premier, his ministers and the members of this chamber. Thank you, sir. Thank you.